All right. Hello. Good evening. Welcome to the May meeting of the Baton Rouge Astronomical Society. This evening, I want to introduce Tom Northrup. Most of us know him. He's been a member for a long time, also worked here at the observatory for a long time. Tom has had an interest in the Apollo program since the late 60s and has maintained his interest throughout the entire space shuttle program and the construction of the ISS and continues to keep up with NASA's current moon program. He's going to be talking about 50 years of the Apollo program. Tom, I'd like to come say hello and talk to everyone. And uh, Stephen and Thomas are both with us online. Okay. Tom? Well, I think we're all today. Great. Yeah. Okay, well, as you can already tell, we're talking about Apollo 16 tonight. And uh, before we get to that, I want to go all the way back to the Wright brothers when they flew their Wright flyer on Kill Devil Hill in the city of South Carolina. I'm sorry about the little line at the top. It's a uh, projector. projector, thank you. It's uh, not a line. But uh, we'll make it work. So in 1903, they, uh, they flew their machine here in South Carolina. Now then, they had a competitor. And his name was... Uh, His name was Gustav Whitehead. He was a recent immigrant from Germany. Actually, when he moved here, his name was Weissman. Or I guess they pronounced that Weissman. 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 And then uh, German. But he changed it to Whitehead because he thought it sounded probably more American. And he uh, was a mechanic of sorts. He liked to work on engines. And he built his own airplane. And this is like a year or two before. Now, they're, they're, this is very contested. It's not. It's not a set in stone. In other words, but this is his his uh contraption here, and it flew according to what some people said. They signed they signed sworn affidavit affidavits as you pronounce it um, that he had uh, flown this thing about a mile, and it took off under its own power. Now, they said that there was a somebody, I found online where somebody said that somebody had taken a picture of him flying, but it was so grainy, such at a distance, I, don't, I didn't feel like I should be showing it to, as evidence, because I certainly didn't take it as It's possible. But uh, if you want to find out more about it, there's a website there. Um, and uh, it's uh, getting a bit of a follow-up. I, I don't remember how I found this book. It's at the LSU library. Obviously, when I'm researching it. I know it's, I think, on the second floor, maybe it's not on the ground level. But I found that little booklet, little booklet on the bottom shelf. Again, I don't know how I... But obviously, I had to research to find it. But it's a yearbook of German American studies. And in that book, they have a chapter about the relationship between Whitehead and the Wright brothers. And it was not a pleasant relationship. They didn't like each other. Well, you know, between the brothers. They were very hotly hot, uh, competitive with one another. Now, Back in 2013, this is the Bible when it comes to the, the different aircraft. It comes out every year. In 2013, I could not find a volume anywhere, at least in six of the libraries here in town. I called and called and called. They said, no, they don't have the 2013 edition. But in 2013, I really wish they had because in print, on the title page, they dedicated that year's issue to Gustav Whitehead as being the first one to fly. Now, they have since retracted it, backed off on that thing. 
but it's in print. Hmm. It's like feathers to the wind, you know, it's, it's out there. So, but did he fly? I don't know. If you had, if you had a picture of him, it would be more convincing. But it's still interesting to think about. Now then, um, we all kind of know, I'm going to talk more about this later, that NASA was basically a, a byproduct of the Cold War. Well, I believe that World War, or the uh, NACA, the NACA, was basically a byproduct of World War I. Because the Americans were falling behind in aircraft technology. Believe it or not, the French were leading the way. And uh, we needed to, or they felt like they needed to really bear down and get better at that sort of thing. And so they developed the NACA uh, in 1950. Actually, I think it was like a year or two before, but it didn't really become active until 1950. And at the same time, there was a, a scientist or professor in New York. I don't remember what university. But he was working on liquid fuel rocket engines. And he was the only one doing it. And he had a really hard time getting money. Now, I think he was only able to get $10,000 in grant money. Now, today, that's not anything. But back then, that was a pretty significant amount still. But at his lectures, well, he, well let me say this first. He, uh, he went to the U.S. Army. And he said, look, I've got this new technology, y'all are welcome to use it. And they just kind of blew him off and said, we're not interested. Well, he said, well, okay, but you should know that the only ones asking questions at my lectures are German scientists. <laughs> and right before he died, right before uh, Goddard died, they brought him in to look at a captured B-2 rocket. And he said, that's my basic engine, engine design right there. For some modifications, but basically it was the same. Now, the only thing I will give the Germans credit for is that they had deep pockets. They put a lot more money into their program than Goddard did. Of course, Goddard was dependent on the U.S. government to, to help him with his technology. But he is the father of liquid fuel technology. So when you get finer people, when I hear people that say, oh, well, Nazi Germany was responsible for the Apollo program. No, nope, we wouldn't have made it. We wouldn't have made it without Robert Goddard. So, and this is in the glad I had a color photograph, or colorized photograph, excuse me. I don't know what's happened with, it's been a long time since I've given this. And I'm used to this slide, and everything's kind of out of line, so I'm sorry about that. Well, in 1958, yeah, I think if we raise the screen, if we bring that white screen, yeah, yeah, I'll hurry up and talk about that. Uh, the, the screen, I mean, we said it's locked in place. It's locked. I mean, it's okay. But anyway, uh, the NACA became NASA. In 1958, and basically their mission was kind of the same. But you know, with NASA again, like with the NACA, it was a byproduct of the Cold War. I remember that era. I was born in '60, and the first mission I remember was one of the Gemini missions, just barely, just barely. But um, anyway. One of the things that they did, though, that I thought was very interesting, is that they called for NASA to disseminate the benefits of research and development to the general public for commercial benefit, which you know, basically spin off technologies. And we have a lot of those today. Thousands of them. Thousands of them. Now then, it got started off with uh, John F. Kennedy's speech to Congress to get money. For the program, and he did. 
And then about a year or so later, in Wright Stadium, uh, he gave his speech, uh, um, made his speech there. Well, things got off the ground. Uh, here we have, uh, I believe this is uh, John Cobalt. I think that's how you pronounce his last name. He was uh, responsible for the Lima Corvette rendezvous. He said that's the only way the mission would work. According uh, uh, to what I've seen, all the, they were planning on launching a full rocket and landing that whole rocket on the moon and then taking off again. And John Hobalt said that is not going to work. And he was able to convince everybody there at NASA that his design was the best. And I think it was a good idea because uh, I don't know if we would have made it otherwise. But if you notice, he's using a chalkboard there. Do we even use chalkboards anymore? <laughs> I mean, I know they have whiteboards now. Chalkboards are not a Yeah. But. My father <laughs> was a my father was a civil engineer, and every once in a while, about once a month or so, he get out his papers and everything, adding machine and his slide rule, and he did work at home sometimes. And I asked him, I said, I asked him when I started doing this because I wanted to, you know, show it. And he said, Sean, I threw you that thing. Crash as I was walking out the door. <laughs> he was he was sick of it. <laughs> but he was a civil engineer in the telecommunications. Communications. And this is you know a picture of how kind of how they you know that's not my dad there, it's a picture of found. Um, we even have a we got people to the moon and back using slide rules and not calculators. So that's right. right. Yeah. Yeah. I got here. Slide rules in my, so my junior year in college. We have a Buzz Aldrin here on his Gemini mission. He didn't take that up as, you know, just to show off. You know, he, that was an active tool. He used it. Absolutely. Use it. Uh, by the way, a lot of my dad worked in the same. I have this. Yes. Yeah. I have this on slide rule, and I updated it when one of First couple years at LSU, we didn't have calculator yet, so I have a circular. Oh yeah, so I see you know. yeah, those are good. Uh, it's only about but what they had to do. They had to work all the different problems out ahead of time. All they had to do with the slide was substitute numbers on this. Yeah. So it wasn't like they had started from nothing. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, they had to start from. Well, anyway, let me uh, everybody, most everybody here will recognize all the rocks. Oh, yeah. And you got, I, I won't talk about them all, but uh, let me see. This, this, the, this is the, the Mercury Redstone rocket. Yeah, how many times did it blow up? Oh, yeah. 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 Well, those were actually, the Mercury Redstone and the Mercury Atlas were actually used to launch ballistic missiles. Mm -hmm. right. The Saturn V right here. And of course, the Saturn 1B, which was a crew launch vehicle, were actually the first purpose built rockets to go anywhere. Right. I mean, as far as leaving the orbit. Right. Oh, I didn't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, this, probably know this is with uh, we launched Skylab in the actual right. lab itself. And I don't know if some of y'all may have been out to the uh, Johnson Space Center where they have a full-size mock-up. It was actually a trainer. Train mm -hmm. That thing's pretty big on the inside. Oh, yeah. I mean, if they want to go anywhere, like, you know, they're talking like tomorrow or anything, they ought to take that thing out of mothballs and, and use I mean, plenty of space on it. And then, of course, we all recognize the space shuttle here. Well, this rocket here, which I think is a pretty cool-looking rocket as far as uh, design goes, but it was very poorly designed according to one engineer who actually worked on the rocket, former Soviet engineer. He said it was very poorly designed. And, you know, they were in a rush to try to keep up with us. Mm -hmm. Only at that time, in the Soviet era, you know, we knew there was something 
what they were doing. Just didn't quite know what it was. I think we even had satellite photos that saw something on the launch pad, something big. But we didn't quite know what it was. Well, this is it right here. Well, one of them. They built four of them. All four of them either blew up on the launch pad or shortly afterwards. And you notice this lattice work here. I thought that was very curious, what that was for. And what the Soviets did was, for staging, they did what was called hot staging. In other words, when, let's say, let's say this is the first stage right here, when it was almost, its fuel was almost used up, before they detached it, they would fire up the engine from the second stage. Right. I'm not sure why they did that. That seemed like that would be very dangerous. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, they still use that same lattice work design. They still do that hot mm -hmm. stage if you can see it right here. So apparently it works for them. So I read, I read why they did it that way, and I guess it kind of made sense, but but I, I'd rather stick with the way Nancy did it. And I have a picture for it. Would it have been to allow that stage to build up for us? It could have been. Been. So that's that when possible. you separate, you're ready yeah. to go. Yeah, that's possible. But uh, anyway, this is. I got a trigger finger here. Well, but it's keeping it forward when we get backwards. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm very <laughs> dysfunctional with these things. I have a, a love-hate relationship with technology. Oh, man. Okay, let's talk about the moon landing. <clears throat> their moon landing. This was the Soviets. And it was built for one, uh, one uh, excuse me, cosmonaut. And um, it was two-stage, like the... Uh, are in the modern world. But uh, it was a very convoluted process to get in that thing and to get it running. First, he had to, he had to do a spacewalk outside the craft that he was traveling in, do a spacewalk to get into this, get into the hatch. And how that would have worked, I don't know. You know, it seemed like it was very ad hoc. But anyway, this is a size comparison. I think it's called the L3. I don't know if that was just the American Storm Force, that was the actual designation. And our uh, aluminum, I don't know, I'll show you a little while, but it was two stages. The set, mm -hmm. set stage, which is the asset stage. Now, this is the Soviet uh, Union's rocket. Being built. They built them on the side, on laying down on the side. I think what they did is they had it like on, I don't know, like rollers or something. They could rotate it and, and work on it. And I could do a big yeah. But the main problem with it, at least with the first stage, we know. Did you have a question? No. Oh, 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 oh. Did you just point oh, out? Yeah. Yeah. 30. There are 30 engines. 30, I thought it was 29. 30 engines. They had 30 engines, and that's why it kept yeah. blowing up. And that's why the engineer that I heard, or I mean, here, yeah, read the article about it, he said that they could not communicate with each other. And that was, that was part of the problem. Yeah. At least, for, for who knows what was, if there was anything wrong with the rest of it. It could have been, certainly could have been. Now, the Russians, even to this day, said that their engines were more powerful than NASA. Really? Well, if your rocket blows up, it doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as far as I'm concerned. And they needed 30 to get yeah. the first stage off. Oh, we only needed five. Yeah. Well, there it goes again. What was the relative weight of the two rockets that left off? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm I mean, it's exactly what now, okay. You saw these were the the, the, the <laughs> I'm 
sorry, y'all. Okay, now this is the uh, uh, one of the space shuttles after you know it got back from the mission and cleaning it up. And you see these engines right here. These are the three main engines. Now the and this of course is the, the hind end of the uh, Saturn V. Yeah, F1. This F1 engine could put out just one of them. Just one of the F1 engines could put out an equal amount of power and thrust as all uh, equal to all three of the main space shuttle engines. Yeah, one point five million pounds. Yeah, that's about you know there's a little bit of yeah. a difference, but but not much. Um, well, I said the Soviet Union they lost all four of their rocket arms. We launched thirteen Saturn V. Successfully, we lost. We almost lost one of them. One, I think it was the first one. Yeah, we were coming out. Yeah, and they lost one of the engines. And the only way they saved the mission was they just burned the rest of the engines long. My brother saw the Apollo 17 night launch, and I was totally no way in that I got sick because he held and I hated that for the rest of the time. It was the last one. Uh, well, anyway, let's talk about Apollo 16. We have uh, John Mag, no, John Young, Ken Magway, and Charlie Big. Uh, maybe they are. You know, Ken Magway, he was the one um, that was exposed to the measles. Mm -hmm. He was supposed to be the. Uh, uh, Man model pilot for 13. Right. He got bumped. Well, he got to go. He got, he got his chance to go. And I'm sure he jumped at it when he would go around and sick people. For the most second chance. Well, this is now I, I've got a film to tell you on these slides. I'm kind of taking you through the mission as it happens. And as such, I'm going to be showing slides that are similar to what done Apollo 16, but they're of a different mission. Now, let's see, this is launch day, I believe, of Apollo 12. And the reason I can tell it's launch day is because look at the binoculars. And the guy said, you know that they're going to launch something. But, uh, but I believe that said that it was Apollo 12. <laughs> well, I think this is the slide uh, or a picture of the actual Apollo 16 rocket launching here. Now you notice, or go back to this launch control center there in uh, we call it uh, Cape Canaveral. Or they call it, actually, I think it's called Cape Kennedy. Now, but since then, that time, they've changed it back to Cape Canaveral because there's a lot of history right. with that <coughs> And so now we call it the Kennedy Space Center at right. Cape Canaveral. But anyway, they had control of the rocket with the launch, the actual firing up of the engines, until it cleared the tower. Right. That could you you can hear you can even hear in some of the mm -hmm. video you can say power clear right yeah, you can hear, you hear him say that so so mission control there in Houston took over from that now this is a picture I can tell this is of uh, Apollo 13 I look very much like Fred Hayes and I even said that somebody um, commented on this saying that this hat this picture was taken just a few moments before the explosion took place. Uh, you see uh Gene France here sitting at his station. Yeah, Gene France. Now uh, one thing I want to talk about here are the, the little uh, stations that they were at. These were not computers. We didn't have desktop computers. Computer technology was starting to come around. I think the first Computer on a rocket was a Gemini program. But these were actually TV monitors. 
And what they did was they had two channels. One channel, they could view what was up here. And the second channel, and I've read, but it's been so long, it does a very complex way. What they did was each technician had a station. And his, the data that he read, of course, was different from everybody else, because, of course, they were keeping track of different things. Well, for each station, they had they had a, a, a room in the back somewhere where they would get the data, raw data, from the spacecraft. And they had slides that would print out the numbers have in front of a video camera or take a picture of it or video, I don't remember, and they would send it to the technician at the station within just a matter of seconds. Now I don't I don't know how they did that, but, but they managed to do it. There's a this is Apollo 11 as we launch it. You can see the uh, it's breaking the sound barrier that was thrown on me. But you can see it didn't take it long to get to that what is it, 760 something miles an hour whatever the sound barrier is. Didn't take them long to reach that, that speed. Anyway, this is it. Uh, it's, you can tell it's getting up higher in the atmosphere because the plume is starting to spread out. Now then, there was one day that I didn't have anything planned when I was working here, when I was some supervisor here. I, I think I was the only one here at the time. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to go to Home Depot. I found out that, what well, I forgot to mention, that the rocket itself was 363 feet tall. Right? Now look at the flame trail. It's about two and a half to three times longer than the rocket. Well, I got, I don't know, I didn't have anything planned for one day. So I went to Home Depot and I ran one of the, I don't know what you call the wheel, the, the wheel that, that calculates the, the dynamic, yeah, and so what I did, I took a screenshot of Google Maps with the observatory right here. Oh, very cool! And I placed the hind end with the engine <laughs> bolt right above where that column is. I mean, I was able. I, I found out how tall, how tall the uh, first stage was, and by that I was able to calculate about how far it would reach out into that field. Well, you can see that flame goes all the way across Highland Road and into the other part. That's cool. I'll give you a little. So, so if that if that really was able to do that, everything that way would have been scorched. Here it is, getting ready to stage. And this is, I guess, yeah, right, cold, staging. cold staging? I don't know. I, yeah, I, that's right. I heard yeah. staging, but I didn't know that it was the hot staging. And, but we, we, I think it was interconnected on to when the first stage disconnected that triggered relay right. stuff, which yeah. fired the second stage. Right, because yeah. there was a delay before the second stage. There was a, little, there was a relay delay in there. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I mean, this is, you know, I'm traveling so fast, it's taking coats on. Right. It's not going to fall down. No, it ain't coming back yeah. after eight days. So. That's cool. That's, that's a cool shot. Wow. Now, th this is one of the, uh, I don't know, I guess it's probably the seventh stage because they're already, you can see that something, but that is from, that is what we call the We're yeah. talking about how it's there. Look, South America, that's it. Yeah. 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 I mean, they had the best of the best, and this is all film. film. That's right, yeah. film camera, no digital technology. That fuller picture, of yeah. Of, of digital of technology, eight. I don't think, came out mm -hmm. until '75. That's when the first digital camera came out. So, yeah, they had the best of the best. I'm going to be showing a little bit of that near the very end. Mm -hmm. And this is. Uh, they use the little module on it. What they would yeah. do is they would 
You pass them in, they, they turn it around, they turn the command module around. Yeah. Now, now look at these. Uh, you see these lines here? Y'all know, know, some of y'all know, I don't say that. But uh, I'm going to talk about that, what those are. But it would, it would come together, they dock together, and then they would. I, th I don't know that they went in that mode. I think they went vertical. And what they did was they uh, heard out Warren Warren said they, they did the plug in this mode. Where, where, in other words, so one side wouldn't be hot all the time and the right. other side wouldn't be cold. It did a slight spin on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. 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 The sun side is very hot. But he said barbecue mode. I said, oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Apollo 9, but I thought that was a beautiful picture. Yeah. yeah. Now, the astronaut that took this picture, and I think it was a. Is that a Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know Dave Scott was the commander of this. And the astronaut. That was taking the picture that was standing on the, the front porch of the you know, lab. Gary Scott was taking pictures of him, of course, of Earth and, and that. And he said, Hold on just a minute, I gotta go change film cassettes in the camera. So he was in there for a few minutes. And here's his astronaut, he's hanging off the side of the little module <laughs> as the world's going by. He said that was the Best five minutes and did oh, wow. and, and then no harness or, or, or safety line. Remember that I think I got this later on in the photo. This is uh, the line that I was telling you about. This is one of the windows of the uh, command module. And here it is. I think this is of Apollo 15 right here. Well, the uh, little module, they would separate from the command module. And this is Apollo 11. And they start on their way. And what are these things here? The rod. You see, they're contact. Yeah, they're contact. Yeah. They're contact. yeah. They, they call them probes. And I don't know why, because you didn't put them in anything to measure. Because the probe is like a measure. But it would uh, detect when they. Uh, in contact with the surface of the moon. And you see up here, cut off. This is a loop. This is a hollow 12 on its way down to the surface. And of course, uh, this is kind of how they arrange it. You get my good picture of this graph. I had to tell that to a best I said. Who took the picture? Alien. <laughs> <laughs> she dropped it. It was a pain. But, you know, I don't know why I got these black photos, these black uh, slides in the back of the Well, I couldn't find the photo I wanted. But this is the photo. This is still a good shot of the, uh, the, the little model. This is Apollo 11. Uh, Neil Armstrong took this picture of Buzz Aldrin right as he was coming out of the hat. It's still kind of a cool shot way to angle it. But the first picture that Neil Armstrong took after he stepped foot on the moon, he took a picture. He took a picture of this of the foot with the rod, one of the rods bent underneath to show that it worked. Well, in that shot, there's also this white bag, which is also, which just so happens to be the trash that the astronauts bag all the trash up and set it up underneath it. So I guess you could say. That the first photograph, you know, took a picture of their trash. <laughs> <laughs> and that was not a plastic bag, that was cloth. Now, this is a picture of half the front of the control panel. Now, remember me telling you about those rods, those contact rods. I mean, those contact rods. Well, let's see. I mean, yeah, this, this little button right here, that's actually a light. Above it, it says lunar contact. One, one or all of those rods would 
touch the surface, that light would come on, and then they'd shut the engine off, and they'd draw up the rest of the way. And so why didn't they just land it? Because in one sense, gravity of the moon, they wouldn't have been able to land because the engine was so powerful. Yeah. And they didn't want to run out of fuel. I know in Apollo, what, Apollo 11, they had like 16 seconds. Yeah, 16, 16 seconds. seconds. That's, That's right. right. If you listen carefully, you'll hear one minute, and you'll hear 30 seconds. Right. And then a few seconds later, you hear contact light and be shut. I, I heard 16 seconds. I saw an interview right here, as a matter of fact, when we had the TV up there connected to NASA. And Gene Kranz, who was the director of that mission, he said once they got to 30 seconds and how close they were, he felt reasonably comfortable with everybody, but he was still kind of sweating. <laughs> they did because they were supposed to pull the plug at 30 seconds. That's right. They didn't land. Now this right here, you can see this. This is the guidance computer. They did have computers back then. And, and in, in my opinion, it's kind of like a rudimentary, very rudimentary. Computer, what we have today, they would, they would have this little keyboard that would know, say bird and something. I, I don't know exactly what the sequence or anything that they, what they used for that, but it was basically it was like a little keyboard. Then, of course, you have the monitor here, and set up behind it was the actual CPU. And the CPU was a little bit bigger than, let's say, a shoebox. That thing weighed 70 pounds. But it not only had 4K of memory. I've had little burner telephones that I've got at Walmart that had more. <laughs> I'm saying the same goes that the digital watch on your wrist has more computing power than the one on your Apollo. Yeah, that's but that's right. all they needed. And what they did was you see these slide marks here. They had two windows, and they have an offset slider. Just to give you. This is the best way I understood it. Of course, it was, it was like a technical jargon. But yeah, here it read out what is that? Let's say, you know, uh, a 10 read out. It said 64. But, and that was your landing. You knew that was where you were going to have to land. If you could see 10 right there, you, the astronaut would just stand just so to where those thread marks would line up, and he'd know right where to set. And this is a fish I shot of, a, of the astronauts training inside of a mock up of the, of the lander. I'm just showing this to kind of give you an idea of the type of space. This is Gene Simon. I read it from the established Amazon Apollo 10. Now, I heard that NASA short fueled that mission. The Apollo 10 was just a breath rehearsal. They were only to go like within 50 miles to the lunar surface and then they would come back. The government said, We're not giving you enough fuel to land and return. Now, they could have landed had they had a full tank, but they would not have been able to get, get back. So they, they short fueled it. With that in mind, because they know Stafford and Cernan were just cagey enough to do that. Oh, they've done it. <laughs> Yeah, we don't care if we get fired. You know, we're <laughs> we're the first men on the moon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The last ones to study too. Yeah. So this is uh, like a sandwich in this well. Again, uh, show. this is a, of the hatch right here. This is the, the hatch that they came in and out of. Now they had another hatch on top, which is what they used to go to and from the command module. And they also used it. Um, I know what I, I got a picture of Apollo 15 of Dave Scott when he opened the hatch after they landed and just kind of took a, you know, some photos, panoramic shot from the top. That's inside the hatch. That's the hatch inside. Now, this is the outside of the hatch. Now, I've heard uh, people say for against this there, that the astronauts. When they went onto the surface of the moon, they made sure that the door stayed open. Because if they closed it when they were outside, they would it would lock and they couldn't get back in. 
Now, I've heard some people say, no, 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 that's just an urban legend. Maybe. But I did hear audio, listening to audio, of when those all and Neil Armstrong were on the moon, and they were on their, on their little excursion. And right as he was coming out, Buzz Aldrin was coming out, and Neil told him, he said, make sure you leave the door open before we have a home to come back to. So, I don't know. It's tough to be locked out. <laughs> so, <laughs> they have to the you know, know where you get in. <laughs> they have to call Papa Lock. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. I don't know. I don't know how you would leave the home. I don't, don't forget from leave the door open. I know, I know another uh, uh, thing, that, and I heard Buzz Aldrin talk about this. When they came in from their mission, and of course, before they took off their ass, their suits and everything, they still had the pack on. When uh, they got everything off, come back, they threw the packs outside, and of course, they didn't need them anymore. Buzz Aldrin looks down and he sees a switch. The Pokemon? Broken one. Oh, yeah. And. Uh, it just happened to be the switch to, to watch fire your rockets. Yes. Yeah. And, <coughs> and so that really happened. That's not, you know, that's not urban legend. That really, that really took place. Mm -hmm. Is that the thing you did? No, no, yeah, he, he put a pin in it, and he, he stuck a pin in it, right. and it worked. And then he, and he took the cartridge out of it and put it on the end there, and he was able to right, he push it down and over the little stuff in yeah, that right. rocket switch and mail the fire. So he, during that interview, Lady asked me, Aren't you scared? What do you mean? So, well, we would have just worked the problem until we ran out of oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's fun. I mean, that's basically all you can do, you know. But just so nonchalant about it. Well, I just nice. threw this nice shot. Well, this is Apollo 16 as it landed, as it was on the moon. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the uh, aerobic in a bit. But a two-stage, yeah, a two-stage craft. The lunar rover, so let me get my notes here. Yes, yeah. yeah. The, the right rear wheel. Yeah. I think uh, Gene Cernan got, he had a tool in his pocket and got hooked and it snapped. Now, first off, man, that's some pretty flimsy stuff that you got, you know, when it, I think it was just fiberglass or something. Yeah. You know, when it's exposed to extreme temperatures, I guess anything becomes wet. I mean, I saw her too, so I don't remember which mission it was, but uh, John Young was out. And he was driving, was driving like a dune buggy. He was acting a lot. Oh, yeah. I was, this afternoon, I was just put with some finishing touches. I, you know, I could work on these 24 hours a day. I'd never be done with you know, keep adding stuff and adding stuff. I have it in one of the, the earlier presentations that I did, but I didn't have enough time to look for it. Little reconnaissance over it. They sent back up. They took photographs. All the landing sites. Mm -hmm. And above, the, that took a picture of the Apollo 16, and you could see where they did donuts. Yep. Uh, <laughs> in fact, you can see a video. <laughs> you can see a video of, of, they of John Young just <laughs> cruising along eight miles an hour. I think it was yeah, he speed. set the last speed record on the. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he had fun with it. Yeah, you okay. can see the little donuts. I mean, just a typical guy thing. You know, what are you doing when you get a new car? You know, you get out there and see what it can do. Right now. But he didn't bring a corned beef sandwich. Right? Yeah. No, he didn't. Yeah. No, <laughs> well, this is uh, them loading it up. I don't know which mission this is for. Or if they were just testing it out on a mock up. I don't know. But this is them loading up the Lima Rover into a bay that was, I think, like. About four feet long by mm -hmm. three feet deep. Yeah. 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 All yeah. They folded the wheels over the top. Mm -hmm. 
like a transformer, and just <laughs> folded it up into place. And that's what it looked like on, on the way there. This is the actually this, actually, this is the bottom of it. But I thought that was cool. Kind of. There was a guy, I can't remember his name, but he advocated that we never landed on the moon. And he had all these different proofs. So one was that thing. He said, no way, that machine could fit us, I think it's a two day. Yeah. If they had spent any time on any research, we would realize the thing folds up. Yeah. You know, I, can, I couldn't believe it. I saw, you know, you hear about these people who are flat earth and say we never went to the moon. You know, back there was going to school at LSU, I went there to pick her up. And I was going around in front of the building that kind of circle of the the student union building today. They have this free speech one way or something. Right. Anybody yeah. can come. Yeah. Well, I saw this fellow, well, he had a group of people who were the students standing around him. And on the signboard, he had like a NASA logo. I said, oh, cool. I'm here. I'm going to go. I'm going to go back and go listen to this. Oh, what a boy. I see one of these flat earth people. He was saying NASA faked everything. And, and these kids were really brothers. I didn't have it. And I said, look, I don't, you know, they're, they're taking care of this. <laughs> I, I couldn't believe, you know, it's like, wow, they really do exist. You know, you know, oh, that we, they come to every outreach. Really? Every yeah, I outreach. encountered a flat earther at uh, one of the hotel. It was interesting. Yeah. I always liked the uh, one that uh, wanted to spot Buzz Aldrin all the time. Oh, yeah. And Buzz Aldrin. Yeah, that's right. Bunch of men in the face. Yeah, and Buzz came out for something. A group of people come out for where he can talk once, and this guy just jumps right in his face. And Buzz has finally had enough of this guy. Yeah, him out. And, had, and Buzz just looked at him. This guy started raining at him. Got Buzz just punched him right out. I thought he well, no. I always thought, what if somebody could be speaking? Oh, okay. No, we're excited. Sorry about that. Huh. Well, we didn't know. That was fine. How do I uh, get this back? I'm sorry, I hit the wrong button. I thought I hit the. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh -oh. It would be your computer, so I, I, I'm not familiar with Mac. Hold on. Hold on. Believe it or not, they thought about using motorcycles on the moon. You can believe that. In fact, when NASA was going to try to start up its moon program again early to mid 2000, this fellow that had advocated for that was still alive, he was still pushing for mini bikes on the moon, which I don't think would have been for a while. I think with you know inertia and everything that you know mm -hmm. that they would have that would have been different. They had enough trouble walking. Yeah. Can you imagine how that would I can see a face by <laughs> Well, I would be very remiss if I didn't include this. They had an actual telescope yeah. on Apollo 16. Now I did look around and I wasn't able to research I guess I information somewhere out there, but I don't know if they attached the camera to it or if the camera was built into it. But they took pictures of a, a star, this is an actual photograph, and, and of the Earth's atmosphere. Um, I'm not sure what they were looking for in this picture, but still it's a cool photograph taken from the moon. And this is what it looked like, it's a mock -up. They have one at the Johnson Space Center. That's about how big it is. About the size of most of the ones we have here. And this is uh, this is John Young. He's jumping flat foot, mm -hmm. about three feet. You can see the uh, telescope yeah. there in the background. So I know that's a 16. Yeah. I think uh, yeah. Uh, Charlie Duke said, "Right, he was taking pictures of Give me that all the way to salute." Yeah. Which one did they drop the hammer on the side? Of? I was 15. I was 15. That was awesome. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah. Well, here we have, uh, this is the uh, 
module 2016, the astronauts are already in the module getting ready to launch. And Rebecca one time asked me, Rebecca, my daughter, she said, who took the picture? I said, well, you know, they had a little rope. They had camera, video camera. And not only that, the technicians and engineers on Earth could operate the test. Because you know, they followed up. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. One of the one of the uh, yeah. uh, when they yeah. one of the missions yeah. they got a yeah. shot of so they followed it. They tracked it. Well, one thing I want is what was left. That's what's there today. I don't know if it looks like that today after 50 years. I can imagine the intense of the violent life. Um, yeah. Well, another cool feature that I really like about uh, the base 15 and 16, they had on there uh, uh, sub satellite. And this is the picture of the one that was on 15, so you can see how. You know, it's a pretty substantial little spacecraft. But what I think is so cool if you think about it, you have the command module, which is the spacecraft, and you have the sub satellite with the spacecraft, which is on the uh, command module and was launched. It was, in other words, you have a, one spacecraft being launched by another spacecraft. Is that probably kind of cool? And this is. About where I think there was no way. It would have been right here. And I, I don't know which mission this is here. I don't know if that's it. <coughs> no, no, that's not no, that 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 right. Oh, okay. That's something that. This is when they were coming back. I can tell this is, I knew this was Apollo 17 when I saw it. You can see the top of Gene Cern's head right there. I said, that's 17 right there. As they're on their way back. Here, this has some of the cameras that were, that were used. Has a blog. They, they used, that was the big one. That was the big one. And then, then they had, you know, they used other cameras, I think. Uh, now, this is an RCA video camera. But I don't know if you see where it says uh, Apollo Command Model TV camera. And well, you saw that one. You can look at this one here. And uh, this is them on, on this is a shot of one of the missions on the way back in. Now, I really like showing this photo here. This is of Apollo 8 as it's coming through the Earth's atmosphere. What I think about is that. You can see, you know, the, the, the friction buildup, the heat that's generated on that spacecraft. But there are three living and breathing human beings in a shirt sleeve environment in the middle of that fireball. And I think what I believe, this is just uh, uh, the uh, little model had what was called a latent material right. on the heat shield <coughs> and it was burned away. That's what I think that probably is. Yeah. So the, the NASA page I got from didn't say anything about that. But they said that photo was taken from uh, an aircraft 50,000 feet in the air. And here you have, uh, uh, I don't know if this is 16 or not, but remember those lines I was telling you about you saw on the command module? Well, this was a type of installation. It's called Captain. Captain. K A P T O half time. Half time, thank you. That sounds better than that. <laughs> but we have a piece of the one from Apollo 11. Ooh. Tell you what, they're making a myth of that stuff. <laughs> the little teeny tiny piece that we got, we got when I was still here, 70 bucks. Wow. So you see all of the money, you know, from all the other missions that did it. Yeah, but we have one. So, so that. That little piece of captain that we had, captain, um, went around the moon on Apollo 11. So, so anyway, I got a closing segment here, and it is the very last thing that um, it took 66 years from the Wright brothers to Apollo 11, and even with all the wars, assassinations, 
protests, and other tragedies of the 20th century, NASA still managed to fly astronauts to the moon, build and fly five space shuttles and their missions, start construction on the International Space Station, and it's still in order today. And I think I can safely say that the 20th century will long be remembered for its place in history when humanity learns to fly. And that's all I have. Have you ever read G. Grant's book, Failure of Not No, I have. Yeah, not a higher up. Okay. Do we have any questions? Wow. That was awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mention it, didn't I? I didn't mention it. They lost on April 16, 1973. Right. 70. 70. 70. Ah. Uh, they could have watched six years before we went to the moon. <laughs> okay, that was for a whole yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So the letters weren't done the long day. No, 72 was the last Apollo mission. It is 72. I have 72. Yeah. 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 72 was the last one. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, 17. So we got one more. Yeah. Well, I had it down. I just didn't read it right. And I was reading. Yeah. 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 No other questions, then? Okay. Thank you very much, Tom. Appreciate it. That was awesome. That concludes our program for this evening. And hope you'll come watch more of them as we film them and also become a member. Scott? You go to sleep? Nobody there. See, our product expert there is a little behind this station there. Okay. What always gets me about any of any of those images are just the switches. You know, you think about the you know, cockpit of plane, but then you sit there and you <laughs> Then you look at the newest space capsule, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Touch screen, yeah. almost yeah. totally out of hand. Go along with our digital business, and I guess we'll leave the live stream on. I have no idea where it is. Okay. Great. I just want to mention that uh, for some of you who might uh, not already have known, we're members. Of course, we This guy. And, uh, this last Saturday morning, about six of us went to his memorial service, and one also went to where his burial site was. So just want to let you all know that uh, we've lost sports. Well done, well liked, man. What we have done there to be good for our business is we needed to have a vote. Try a vote again. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, Tom was long and I had a, a prior engagement. Okay.